You have been lied to your whole lives. Things you believe to be true aren't. The planet we live on does not look how we've been taught. Let me explain. Hi, I'm Matt. Over the last 25 years, I've traveled a lot. I've lived in five countries on four continents. I've flown over 1.3 million miles. I've visited over 100 countries, every American state, but I'm nowhere near done. So hit subscribe and perhaps you'll pick up some hacks, hints and tips to make your next trip better. Hello and welcome to the video. I wanted to make a rather different video today about the planet we live on and the things that I have learned about it over my years. This video is going to be about truth. And that truth is that this is the world that we live on. No, of course not. This is the world that we all live on, and what a beautiful thing it is too. Quite a few people do seem to believe that the Earth is flat though, particularly amongst our American cousins. Indeed, according to the Flat Earth Society, they have members all around the globe. I would so love for that to have been real, but it would have been very, very easy for somebody to fake. It's funny though. I'll come back to the Flat Earth Society a bit later on. So the Earth is a sphere. It's an oblate spheroid, actually, but that still is a sphere. The lies I want to talk to you about today concern how we've converted a three-dimensional globe into a two-dimensional map. So we need a brief history lesson. Gerhard Kramer is the chap we have to thank, or blame. Gerhard Kramer was a Flemish cartographer and mapmaker who very cleverly flattened a three-dimensional globe onto a two-dimensional map in a way that means that any course of constant bearing is represented on that map as a straight line. That was really, really helpful for sailors, even though it meant that certain liberties had to be taken with the representation of the Earth away from the equator. Some say the Chinese had done this centuries earlier, but Kramer was the first to perfect the techniques required for making this map, which he then published for the first time in 1569. If the name Kramer isn't ringing any bells, that's because stage names were a thing even in the 16th century. Kramer is best known under his trading name of Gerardus Mercator, and his projection is known to this day as the Mercator projection. Not a lot that was made in 1569 is still in daily use today, but the Mercator projection is. Antarctica is usually cropped off, but I'm sure everybody recognizes this as the world we live in. But it lies to us. Greenland appears the same size as Africa, whereas Africa is actually 14 times larger. Alaska is shown as the same size as Australia, whereas Australia is actually four times larger. I could go on, and I could talk about how the exaggeration of the size of European countries and the underweighting of the size of equatorial countries led to entrenched perceptions about the relative importance of those two regions. But I won't. Well, I sort of did, but I won't anymore. It really still is in use today, as most online maps are based on the Google Web Mercator model. They use it because it works, and the distortions it produces aren't significant when you're just trying to find the quickest way to IKEA. Interestingly, and I use the word advisedly, if you scroll out on the desktop version of Google Maps, the world turns into a sphere, whereas if you scroll out on a mobile application, it stays flat. See? Told you that was interesting. Let me take a second to invite you to click the like button if you're enjoying this video. That helps out with YouTube. Subscribe if you're new and uh, leave me a comment. I'm really, really interested to hear what you think about this kind of content. The stretching of latitudes was a known consequence from the get-go and eventually led to the Gaul Peters projection first published in 1855. This shows all areas of a map as the correct size relative to each other and is probably also familiar to you. This is a more realistic representation of the planet in that Greenland is 1 14th the size of Africa and Australia is four times the size of Alaska. However, it has one significant drawback in that nothing on the map is actually shown accurately. Everything is distorted in order to produce this size relativity. So by increasing the overall accuracy of the map, every single element of it is now slightly inaccurate which is actually hilarious. History lesson over. So what does that mean to you and me? 
Well, let's consider Anchorage, Alaska, which is half a world away on either projection. So what if I told you that Anchorage was closer to Manchester than Miami, or that Vladivostok was closer to London than Colombo in Sri Lanka? You'd think I was mad, but maps lie to you, and both of those statements are true. Anchorage and Vladivostok are closer. So even the Gaul Peters projection, which made the map more accurate by making every element of it inaccurate, still lies to you as regards the true distances between places. So Anchorage, Alaska is about the same distance from London as Mumbai, but you would never know that from looking at conventional maps. Another example. Let's look at Sydney relative to San Francisco and Los Angeles. What if I told you that San Francisco was actually the closer city? Well, you wouldn't believe me, but it is. It's not closer by much, but it is the closer of the two cities to Sydney. Maps lie to you. So let's look at another way in which maps lie to you. We all know that the shortest distance between A and B is a straight line, right? Well, it is unless points A and B are on a sphere. So let's look at a flight between Madrid and New York, which are both on a very similar level of latitude. The straight line has got to be a shorter distance than the curved line, right? Well, no, because the curved line is shorter on a sphere. Why? Well, because of the great circle effect. The great circle is found by cutting the earth in half with a line that goes through the origin the destination and the centre of the Earth. This is shorter than the direct route because you don't have to go up and over the bulge of the Earth to the same extent. The maths to prove this is a bit mind-bending, but I found a website that did it for me and Madrid to New York via the Great Circle route is about 3% shorter. Not a huge difference because Madrid and New York are on the same latitudes, but if you looked at Madrid to Hong Kong, the Great Circle route would be about 7% shorter. Pilots will have to consider jet streams, weather, fuel, and various other things in determining a flight path, so may not always follow the Great Circle route, but this is the reason why flight paths always look so bendy. So does that matter in the real world? Well, I think it does. Imagine you were in London and needed to go to Hong Kong. A direct flight is obviously the easiest way to get there, but they're often more expensive than connecting via an intermediate city. You may enjoy flying Qatar Airways. I certainly do. And you may notice that Doha in Qatar is about halfway along a direct line between those two cities, so it might seem to be a logical choice for a stopover. While London to Hong Kong via Doha is an amazing 20% further than a direct flight. That's 1,200 miles further, which is a good three hours flying time, not to mention the extra time taken to change planes in Doha. If you do want to break the flight, then consider Helsinki, which is just about bang on the Great Circle route from London to Hong Kong and is only actually 17 miles out of the way. Another quick example, London to Perth. You can now fly this direct, but as it's a 16 or 17 hour flight, you may very well not want to. So where might you stop on the way? A direct flight is 9,009 miles using the Great Circle route. In this instance, Doha is a very smart choice because it's only 40 miles out of your way virtually nothing. Singapore is a popular stopover, but that adds about 2% to your distance. Hong Kong would add about 8%, and Tokyo in Japan would add a whopping 21% to the distance you had to fly to get there. There's one last way that maps lie to you that I want to talk to you about today. Map makers do it very deliberately, and although they don't admit it, they do it for a very, very good reason. Copyright law. This is unlikely to cause any real inconvenience to anybody, but for years, map makers have included deliberate errors in their maps as a way of trapping people who may attempt to copy their maps. I think I said the word maps too often. These are known as trap streets for obvious reasons. I heard many years ago that every single page of an A to Z has a deliberate error on it. That's very hard to validate, but in researching this video, I found one report of somebody who had found a hundred such errors in this very book. One known error is that there is no ski slope in Haggerston Park. 
Another well-known and somewhat tongue-in-cheek error is that there is no Lie Street in Bristol. For younger viewers, in the days before smartphones, us old people used to have to carry one of these around with us whenever we went anywhere if we wanted to know where we were or where we were going. Can you imagine? So there you go. That's three ways in which maps do lie to you. I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope you've learned something. Maybe there's something in there that will be useful to you one day. If you enjoyed the video, please click the like button. If you're new, click the subscribe button and the little notification dingy dingy bell thing to be notified when I post new videos. Please, please leave me a comment because I love to read them. Thanks for watching and I'll see you all again soon. Bye.